Well, hello, and welcome to another episode of FAIR's Innovation Series. This is a series of discussions between myself, Nuri Hong, a parent advocate of a child with food allergies, and a guest with expertise and insights into the science, technology, and trends in food allergy care. Today, we're gonna to take a look at the world of drug development. Specifically, we're going to explore how drugs that start in one disease area sometimes find their way eventually treating many different diseases, either intentionally or unintentionally. Within food allergy, many of you may know of the drug omalizumab, which also goes by the brand name Zolaire. And this is probably one of the best examples of, one of, the, of, of a drug going, starting with one area and moving to another. Specifically in this case, Zolaire was approved uh, for a breakthrough therapy designation by the FDA in 2018 after getting a first approval in 2003 for asthma and had a long journey to get to food allergy. And to give us an insider look into this topic is our special guest today, Dr. Dale Ametsu. Oh, oh, thanks very much. I'm very excited to be here. Thanks very much for the invite. You are really, you know, there couldn't have been anyone better to talk about the history and give us an insider look into this. And for the audience's uh, uh, just understanding, we're not going to dive too deep into the science per se of Zolaire, but this is more of a look at how does drug development work? How does the partnership between academia and nonprofit and industry actually, you know, elucidate and reveal opportunities that, uh, that serve broader patient needs? Dale, before we get started, I'd be remiss if I didn't give your background to the audience. Um, and I'm going to apologize because I'm, I'm going to read uh, your lengthy and accomplished background here so that everyone can get a sense of who you are, where you came from, and the expertise that you bring to this conversation. So bear with me for just a second while I, I go through this. Uh, so obviously, you are what, uh, a leading physician within the food allergy and atopic space. But very specifically, you previously served on the American Board of Allergy and Immunology was chair of the NIH Immunological Sciences Studies section and was annually selected since 2001 by America's top doctors. You also had a distinguished academic career serving as a chief of the Division of Allergy and Clinical Immunology at Stanford University and formerly as Prince Turkey Al Saud Professor of Pediatrics at Harvard Medical School and director of the asthma program at Boston Children's Hospital. Later on, you joined Genentech in 2013 where you served as principal medical director and global development lead for Zolaire or omalizumab, and where you led large cross-functional teams responsible for developing novel treatments for patients with respiratory and allergic diseases. While at Genentech, you led projects with that team to gain FDA approval for omalizumab in chronic idiopathic urticaria in pediatric asthma and obtaining FDA approval of a pre-filled omaliz omaliz omalizumab syringe and in obtaining FDA breakthrough therapy designation in food allergy. You're also directly involved in the broader clinical development plan for that product in other indication areas and directly collaborated with the NIH on the ongoing study Outmatch or what is now known as Outmatch. After Genentech, you were also formerly VP or you took a VP position as clinical development lead at Dermira, which is a biotech company also developing an antibody product in atopic uh, dermatitis which was acquired later by Eli Lilly. And currently you're serving as a consultant for several small biotech companies, including Pareto Bio, which is the company where you're, uh, which is the company that I mentioned that I'm directly involved in, where you're an SAB member and interim medical officer. Now with all of that, did I miss anything? Uh, thanks very much. Uh, that that kind of sums it up a little. Well, first off, Dale, I have to say, you, obviously your background is impressive. Uh, you have an incredibly distinguished career, both in academia, but also in industry. And the reason why I was so eager to get you on this conversation for all of this audience to, to hear us chat is most food allergy parents at this point, and I would imagine many that are watching this have some familiarity with Zoller as we try to understand the pipeline for food allergy therapeutics. And I think many of us have seen the development of Zoller starting from academia and uh, fair sponsored studies, for example. Uh, moving into a much more formal program from the manufacturers in food allergy. And I think that it's often, it can be confusing if you're not familiar with the ins and outs of how drug and R&D work. And I thought you'd be a great person just to share like what happens behind the scenes? Like how does something like that, a drug like that first get started in one area, then get studied in many others. And then over you know many decades now, 
eventually find its way to new patients. And in this case, of course, food allergy is what we care about. Um, before we get into that history and understanding you know, how your academic and professional career in, in biotech or biopharma R&D more broadly, um, and how that relates to Zoller, I, I'd like to just give the audience a little bit of background on Zoller without getting too deep. So Zoller is a drug, or omalizumab also, which Zoller is the brand name, omalizumab is the, is the you know, non or, or generic name, non-brand or generic name. This is a drug that's manufactured by Genentech Roche with an ex-US partner Novartis, uh, outside of the US that is. It's an anti-IgE monoclonal antibody therapy. And all that really means is that this is a drug that helps block IgE-based reactions. And in the case of food allergy, that's obviously very important. And originally it was approved for moderate to severe asthma all the way back in 2003, and later in children in 2016, with additional indications for other related conditions along the way. And while it had been studied in food allergy for many years, including studies by fair donors or who are currently fair donors, as well as fair and other uh, nonprofit institutions and government, uh, it did not receive a, a formal breakthrough therapy designation from the FDA until 2018 for food allergies. And now it is pursuing uh, both trials with, uh, as a monotherapy and as an adjunct to multi-allergen oral immunotherapy. That study is in combination with the NIH, uh, supported by the manufacturers, and that's called the OutMatch study. And you can find more of this information in some of the history on FAIR's website if you're curious. But with all that being said, this is just one of many biologics or new therapies that actually work in different disease areas that are now starting to migrate and pursue food allergies and indications. So take us a little bit back to the beginning. So, so you know, so Zoller was approved for asthma, you know, 2003, as you mentioned, that was like two decades ago. So it's a long time. But we started working with Zoller also back in the early 2000s. And Around that time, there were many studies, results being published showing that oral immunotherapy was very effective. And, and th those are really amazing studies showing that OIT was kind of almost like a breakthrough and it caused patients to be less allergic. But of course, there were a lot of allergic reactions uh, associated with OIT. So we started out suggesting that adding Zolaire to OIT might be a way to get rid of some of those allergic reactions and, and make OIT easier and perhaps safer. So, so we, we proposed that, but in the beginning, I think there was a lot of skepticism about this. Um, it's possible it, people didn't really understand that we weren't really suggesting that every patient on OIT should get Zolaire. But we thought that it would be the, the, the patients who were most at risk for developing allergic reactions. And so back in the early 2000s, um, we went ahead with the first study of Zolaire and OIT. Kari Nadeau had just finished her allergy fellowship with me at Stanford, and I had just moved to Harvard. But together, we enrolled about 11 patients with the worst milk allergy that we could find. So we really did not want to treat mild cases of milk allergy with this kind of expensive medication. And surprisingly, we found that Zolaire made the updosing with milk safer with much fewer symptoms. And so we could updose the kids to like 2000 milligrams, about two ounces of milk within seven to eight weeks, as opposed to six to 12 months or longer when you would do it without Zoller. And the other surprising thing we learned that after the patients had been on the top maintenance dose of milk, we could actually take Zoller away. Now, when we first stopped the Zoller on the first patient, we were like really worried that the patient would start to get a lot of allergic reactions, but that didn't happen. And so that was the first study and when Dave Bunning heard about this, who's of course the head of the, the FAIR board of directors, when he heard about this, he became a believer and actually a supporter. So he helped us develop this uh, program over the years. But we did, we did have to convince many others 
And so we did go on to do a number of other studies. So thank, I mean, that, that's fascinating that, you know, the first idea for this came back in the early 2000s. And when you say we, just to be very clear, you were not working at Genentech at that time. You were still in your academic career and we right. was an academic group of investigators that wanted to test this in food allergy, correct? Exactly. So Kari was at Stanford and I was at Harvard. And so we had, we had uh, a lot of communications uh, between us. Zoom wasn't there back then, but we, we had a lot of phone calls and uh, we, um, we did the study with the, the first uh, 11 patients. So it was a very small study, but it, but it uh, uh, really showed that Zoller was very effective with at least milk oral immunotherapy. And that's interesting. So that's often, and that was an investigator sponsored study, correct? Right, so, so we had to find the money to help with this. Uh, uh, we, we had NIH, uh, some NIH funding for this, but yeah, it was, we had trouble actually getting it funded when we first started. So I just wanted to make it very clear for the audience. So this is a drug that a company, a one of the you know, leading biopharma companies in the world, um, and one of the most well-respected was developing for an indication of severe to moderate asthma, which has a significant unmet need as, as many may know. And the underlying mechanism of how the drug worked was an anti-IgE you know, based mechanism. And based off of that premise and knowing what's going on in allergy more broadly and specifically food allergy. And at that time there was nothing that was actually approved or really in the clinical pipeline for food allergy. You and Kari Nido, another investigator, two leaders in the field academically decided to sponsor a study trying to test this. And that's something that actually happens quite often in industry and academia, that when drugs are actually at this stage of approval or available to be tested in other populations, investigators sometimes will try them in different populations uh, to see if the underlying premise or hypothesis in this case that you had would work and have some benefit for a different disease area than was originally intended. So with that, you know, in terms of that starting point. So first off, I think we should say thank you to you, Kari and Dave Bunning for getting together and all the other people who got involved in allowing you to push forward with that study and funding it. Because as you said, after that, a whole series of studies, investigator sponsored studies did start to come out for Zoller and food allergy. Um, but it took some time for it to get, you know, into uh, a, you know, a formal breakthrough status. So what happened since that first study and, and maybe, you know, later on in terms of the development path for a drug like that? Yeah, so, so we set up a number of studies. After milk, we did peanut and we did a placebo controlled trial, um, a multi-center trial. And, and it was around that time that I joined Genentech, I thought that I knew that Zoller was incredibly effective for food allergy, but I thought it was important to make Zoller available to as many patients with food allergy as possible. And so that meant that in my mind that we had to get Zoller approved by the FDA. And I thought that the best way to do that was to get Genentech involved. And, and that's why I joined Genentech in late 2013 and became the global development leader for Zoller. So, so that's where I thought we would start. Um, but in the beginning, Genentech wasn't that enthusiastic about Zoller for food allergy. It kind of was an older drug, it was on the market for 10 years. And Genentech had many other newer drugs and wanted to move on these other newer drugs to, to, for, to them that they were much more interesting than Zoller. So it took a while to get, so, uh, to get Genentech interested in Zoller and food allergy. And, and not, uh, to be very clear and to their credit, you know, Genentech did try to pursue and, and definitely was supportive of those investigator sponsored studies. Part of the problem there was also that food allergy was such a Un misunderstood and underappreciated patient population as well. Um, so I think that in the context of, you know, bringing kind of a different lens to it for a moment, the, the market understanding, broadly speaking, from so many different stakeholders was something that wasn't really fully formed 
even as much as it is today, which we're still you know trying to educate the the broader community around our needs. Uh, but even back then, it was it was it was that much more less understood. So I think that the combination of what you were talking about in terms of the patent length and the and the, the the age of the product relative to the understanding of the market, you know, didn't seem like it was an obvious opportunity that one might go for. Yeah, it, it was as, exactly as you said. There was no appreciation of the significant unmet medical need in food allergy. When I first started uh, looking at peanut OIT, for example, with Zolaire, many of the epidemiologists at Genentech said, there's not enough patients with peanut allergy. And, and so it was, they were looking at data like 10 years old and things like that. So it took a while for them to appreciate the severity of the problem. Um, the, the other thing was that there, there was, uh, again, there were a lot of other drugs at Genentech that, people, uh, that they wanted to invest in. So it took a while to work on some of the maintenance things with solar. For example, there were a number of 10-year studies that were looking at the risk of malignancy, for example. So that 10-year study was completed around the time that I joined, and it showed that there was no increase in the risk of malignancy with solar use. And another 10-year study showed that the risk of anaphylaxis was very low and easily managed. And as you may know, Zoller has a black box warning for anaphylaxis. So we had to kind of really explore anaphylaxis and look at how it affected patients. And a third study, also a 10-year study, showed that using Zoller was safe even in pregnant women. So all of these studies together showed that Zoller was an incredibly safe product and very few monoclonal antibodies, biologics, have this type of 10-year safety track record and the data to prove it. And so I took the, these results and that Zola was incredibly safe and pushed for more development for Zola to the upper management. And uh, they uh, allowed us to look at pediatric asthma, kids six to 12 years old, and uh, the, uh, the FDA was actually very concerned and hesitant about using Zolaire in young children. Uh, but we focused on the great unmet medical need in pediatric asthma, which I was very familiar with, and the fact that Zolaire was very effective and a safe product. And so we submitted this package to the FDA. And surprisingly, the FDA actually agreed and approved Zolaire for young children, six to 12 years of age with asthma. And this was a great surprise to many people at Genentech. And so and then with that, we then we looked at the pre-filled syringe, which you mentioned, which is basically a liquid formulation, a liquid version of the product and uh, compared to the powdered version, which was on the market back then. And People at Genentech were also uneasy with this and said I was wasting some time because there was a, a study that Genentech did that showed that the liquid version was really not as effective as the powdered form, but it just seemed like scientifically that couldn't be true. It's the same monoclonal antibody, one's in a liquid, one is in a powdered form. So I really looked closely at the data and we reanalyzed it and show that the liquid was just as effective as the powdered form. And so we focused on how this product could benefit patients, particularly children. And we submitted this to the FDA. And this time the FDA agreed and approved pre-filled syringe, again, to the surprise of many folks at Genentech. So these, these successes really energized our team and even the management got excited. And so, that's how we started to get momentum to move into food allergy at Genentech. That's a, that's a very, um, I and mean, we could talk about those decisions for a long time, but I wanna say two things related to that. One, uh, on behalf of all food allergy parents and patients, I, I think we owe you a big thank you for taking a risk and leaving a very, very highly distinguished and successful academic career 
uh, at some of the most prestigious hospitals and teaching universities to go and try to make a difference on behalf of patients. I mean, that's very noble. And, you know, you did something that uh, you thought was right and saw an opportunity and went to try to help. And I, and I wanted to say thank you for that. And secondly, um, you know, kudos for you for really making the proper clinical patient case and ultimately the business case for a drug manufacturer of how, the, you know, to see the opportunity for a product that was, you know, maybe not the top priority for a company given their, their vast resources in other areas, um, but really made it possible for not just Genetic Roche Novartis to move in this area, but I think it also opened the door for other companies to see that food allergy was an opportunity to potentially pursue. And that, you know, if a large organization like that sees an opportunity there, maybe there's something there that they missed as well. And that's part of, I think, you know, the, the kind of impact that you actually had. Uh, whether or not Zoller makes it eventually, you know, through the process, I think just the fact that it kept going and got to this point was a huge catalyst within the drug development evolution in food allergy. So I, I just wanna say thank you for that. And thank you to Genentech for keeping at it. Right, well, thanks, thanks. I think though that uh, the Genentech side kind of was half the battle. The other side, I won't say it was a battle, but it was a lot of discussions with the FDA. So uh, we, we had, a number of meetings with the FDA and our initial encounter with the FDA in back in 2015 didn't go very well. So that was when we proposed using Zolair for OIT to peanut. And they actually came back and said that they did not see a path forward for Zolair as what we called adjunctive therapy with OIT. So it was like we hit a dead end. And that, that was early on after I had joined Genetech. So this was a real big disappointment to me. Again, especially since I knew that Zolair could help so many patients. But the FDA did leave a small opening for us though. They said that if a peanut product was FDA approved, we might have a pathway. So, so, so we got together we got together with A-Immune. Steve Dilley back then was the CEO. And they were of course just a couple of miles from Genentech. And so we went together to the FDA this time to, to propose using Zolair and Palforzia, which wasn't approved quite, the, quite, quite, quite yet then. But again, the FDA was not on board they did not believe that we could pre-select patients who might have trouble with palforzia, who might need Zolair. And they suggested, for example, that we should first treat patients with palforzia for six months, identify those who failed, and those were the ones that we could study with Zolair. And I thought that that was way too much to ask any patient. So we basically could not do the OIT study that we had planned together. Um, so so we, we were, of course, very disappointed. But again, I learned a lot from this FDA interaction. Uh, after that, we, we sort of cooled off a little bit, but we went back to the drawing boards. Again, I knew we had a great product, so I did not want to stop. People at Genentech kept telling me I was beating a dead horse. Uh, but, I, but I was persistent. We had a lot of discussions with many, many stakeholders. And at that point, we decided to shift focus of Zoller to monotherapy, that is treatment without oral immunotherapy. And so the monotherapy approach really simplified development and it allowed Zoller actually to be used with patients with any food allergy. And with this simplified approach, actually, the FDA agreed. And in fact, that was when they gave us breakthrough therapy for the Solair monotherapy, which the breakthrough therapy would allow Solair to move more quickly through the FDA. And I should point out that we are not actually studying, or Genentech is not now studying the combination 
of OIT4 FDA approval. It is being studied, but not for FDA approval. And so this third interaction with the FDA was much more productive than the first two. And I think it was because we understood then the FDA's positions and we had proposed something that really aligned with their views. And in addition, over this, these couple of years, I do think the FDA was coming around to accept that Zolaire might actually be beneficial for some patients with food allergy. And I think that's where it has effects on other companies developing biologics for food allergy. I think the FDA is now coming to see the benefits of biologics, these monoclonal antibodies for the treatment of food allergy. That's incredibly helpful to hear the, the connections between all of the, what we'll call the first movers in food allergy, therapeutic development, oral immunotherapy, starting with peanut immunotherapy, Zoller being around for a while and having this potential use in food allergy, but really some potential, um, I just a need for greater education and understanding from various stakeholders. And I think the, the point that I would make there is that the, the importance of having a patient voice going back to the fair audience, you know, couldn't be more, you know, well represented in the story that you just told, because without more patient voice and patient need and understanding, things like the FDA and their, the way that they shifted their view of the need and the population and the relevance of this therapy combined with all of the things that you and the manufacturers did to have that back and forth dialogue and education. It took time and that can be frustrating, I think for all of us that want it right away, but it also took a, a certain amount of understanding and education to get there, which I think connects some of the dots between your history in this space and the patient perspective and what we see kind of going on. And you know, some of the time, sometimes the frustration we all have about wanting something right away to help ourselves or our children. Yeah, it certainly involved a lot of people. And so, I mean, even at Genentech, the team that we got involved with Zolaire for food allergy is, is huge. And of course, the, the FDA is really helping out a lot. And now the NIH and the COFAR team is working on this project to get it FDA approved. So, so there's a, so many people involved in, in getting uh, this to become a reality. It's not there quite yet, but hopefully this outmatch study that Sharon Shinthraja at Stanford is leading along with Robert Wood at Johns Hopkins is gonna get us there. Uh, and so, yeah, we're looking forward to seeing that hopefully within the next two years, perhaps. Yeah, and that's, that's a great way to segue to some of the Q&A and, and Dale, we ran a little bit long, but I know that we're gonna have questions here. So for those that, uh, you know, we'll go through some of these and um, I'll try to truncate and, and kind of collapse some of them together. Um, I wanted to, before we move on to the Q&A, any other comments or thoughts before we transition to kind of the back and forth here with the audience? Um, well, I, I think, I, I, you know, I'm retired now. I'm just uh, doing some consulting, but it was really an honor to have worked at Genentech and also to have to interact with the FDA on so many projects to, to help get better treatments for patients. So hopefully this the study in Zolair with COFAR will, will be successful and, and we'll have a, a new treatment for patients with food allergy. Well, we should all send you a bottle of nice wine for the impact you had on making this happen and, and the broader effect that it had on, on interest in terms of this indication. Okay, so let me just uh, go through a couple of uh, clarifications and I'll run through these questions as well. There have been a lot of questions uh, that have popped up around how do I get access right now for, to Zolaire? How do I request you know, this kind of product from my physician? I wanna caveat a couple of things and make sure it's very clear. There are drugs like Zolaire that have mechanisms that can be used for other indications but we are not recommending that you run out and you go to your physician and request these off label. That is by no, no means what we're encouraging you to do right now. Uh, we do encourage you if you're interested in, in getting involved in clinical trials to speak with your clinician and get into referral sites that are enrolling studies related to, um, you know, to this product, but others that are also being investigated for food allergy. 
um, and, and different populations of that, of, of our disease area. Um, you know, FAIR is a great resource for that, given that FAIR is the leading clinical network. And, you know, I certainly recommend for folks who want to get access to some of these experimental therapies, and the keyword is experimental until they're approved, um, you know, uh, please speak to your physician and, and go through the proper channels. Um, I just want to make sure that we're not getting anybody in trouble here by recommending these drugs per se. Um, now, there are other questions around safety for Zoller. So I want to caveat this, but you may have the information that might be helpful, and I want to make sure it's uh, positioned correctly. So there are questions around serious side effects for younger children, four to six, and are three doses one month apart safe for a four-year-old? And what are some of the interactions with other antihistamines that you know patients might you know commonly be you know prescribed as well? Now, before you get into all that, you can't speak to food allergy per se, other than to say what studies have shown or what you know from asthma. So I want to make sure everyone knows that this is not necessarily for an FDA-approved indication of food allergy. But if you can speak onto what we do know from some of those pediatric studies and other indications, that might be helpful. Sure, sure. So, so Zolaire is definitely not approved for kids less than six, and it's approved for kids six and above with asthma. And so, so Zolaire does have a black box warning for anaphylaxis. So we just have to keep that in mind. I think it's very manageable and it tends to occur in the, within the first three doses in a given individual. The other types of side effects are really quite rare. It's a very safe drug. As I told you, there's more than 10 years. It's now almost 20 years of use of Zolaire in patients, mostly with asthma. And, and so it's very specific for binding to IgE. And, and, and so um, at least in my experience, there, there really were very few very few side effects that, that I, I, I was aware of. Now, now, when you do, as like with the COVID vaccine, if you do millions of patients, you often kind of come up with some reactions. So, but for the most part, it's a very safe drug. Mm -hmm. Okay, and related to safety and uh, potential you know, knowns and unknowns, you mentioned malignancies and, and what's understood in older populations. Could you speak to what's known with some of those same concerns in younger patients? And there's a flip side to that question, I believe. Would there also be a benefit to administering this younger for a quote unquote deeper immune response? And this is something you and I have talked about. So both on the, what do we know about malignancies in younger than six? And then either theoretically or based on your you know, scientific understanding, what do you think the hypotheses are for kind of a deeper immune response if treated earlier? Okay, so let me talk about the malignancy. So the malignancy issue came up in the early phase two and phase three studies. So, so there were there was a few patients on um, solar who had malignancy, but most of these patients were well above 60 years of age. And so it wasn't even clear if it was a real signal. And so that's why the study called Excels was done with 8,000 patients done over a 10 year period looking for malignancy issues. And that study basically showed that there was no increase in malignancy risk. Patients of course will get malignancy if they're older, but it wasn't associated with solar use. Um, so so, so I, I do think that in young kids, there is, again, no, uh, the quote is no increase in the risk for malignancy. That's how the FDA has put it into the package insert. And, and I think that's very true. With regard to um, how Zolair might affect the development of allergy in young children, there is actually a study going on now uh, through the NIH and the, the lead investigator is Wanda Fipitanical in Boston Children's Hospital. And so we're, we are, they are trying to understand that if you give an anti-allergy medicine, a very strong anti-allergy medicine in kids, say two years of age, does that block the development of allergy and asthma and food allergy 
as the child gets older. So uh, we don't have the results of that, that study yet, but I, I think it's a, it's a very interesting concept. And if they could have started even earlier, like in a one-year-old, that might also be very interesting because we know as people get older that their immune system kind of gets set and it's much harder to change. Uh, um, and, and once you get allergy, it, it is somewhat difficult to kind of get rid of it. Yeah. And do you think uh, modulating free IgE with Zoller that early, would you suspect that there's any other um, kind of, I guess, easily identifiable risk other than, you know, making sure that there aren't other serious side effects with you know, based on the mechanism and early immune development? So, so you, you know, theoretically, I do not think there is an issue. And so um, I think like anything, the FDA will require long-term safety studies to kind of just, if it gets approved for young children for say for food allergy, that they will require the, uh, the company Genentech to follow kids over a long period of time to see if there's any side effects. Um, and, and that's true for any drug uh, that gets approved by the FDA. You have to kind of study it. It's, it's certainly a new treatment. So one has to see if there are any potential side effects that you might see when you start to treat thousands and thousands of patients. But so far in the patients that have been treated, there haven't been major side effects except for the anaphylaxis that I mentioned earlier. Right, yeah. Okay. And, and, then, and as you uh, mentioned, that's that's relatively rare. So, so yeah. just keep that in mind. Yeah, no, absolutely. And um, I'm gonna caveat, or I'm gonna just comment on many questions that came in re related to prescribing uh, recommendations and, um, you know, kind of, limitations or, or requirements for dosing and administration of Zolaire. I'm gonna ask, I'm gonna repeat what I said earlier that this is not FDA approved yet. So, you know, we would wanna stay clear from saying anything related to uh, prescribing information related to Zolaire. Number two, if you do want to understand Zolaire for other indications like asthma, clearly, you know, please see, you know, speak to your physician for, for recommendations and a discussion. I, I'd rather not go through the back and forth prescribing, uh, you know, protocol here. Um, we are, we're over time and I suspected that you and I be able to chat and you get a lot of questions as well related to this topic. So, um, I'm going to take a couple of questions here and try to synthesize some and, and then we can, we can call it for today. Um, I, I think that you've answered this. One of the questions was when will this be available? I think you mentioned it's currently in that outmatch study and that hopefully over the next couple of years that will read out and it's potentially, it could be approved at that time. Is that your understanding if it's successful? Yeah, so so it's, this is the a phase three study. So if it is successful, then Genentech will submit the application for licensing to the FDA. And since it has breakthrough therapy designation, the FDA will try to rapidly get it through the process. So I imagine that if we keep our fingers crossed, maybe the end of next year, but, but again, we need to make sure that the trial is done. Uh, it's not fully enrolled yet. So if you wanna help out, you can enroll in that study. And uh, if it's successful, then, then we can, uh, then Genentech can move forward with the FDA to see if they agree. Yeah. Yep. Okay. That's great. Um, great cl clarification there specifically on the timing. And last question, and I'll kind of roll this up. You've mentioned that, but I think just for the clarity of everyone, fair to say that Zolaire, based on what you know and how it works, that it would theoretically have benefit for patients with multiple allergens and work for multiple age groups. Is that fair to say? Yes. Yes. So, so theoretically, the process, the mechanism of food allergy is the same for multiple different foods. Uh, clearly, some foods cause more severe reactions like peanuts and tree nuts. But I think that IgE is involved in all of those food allergies and solar neutralizes them all. 
So we think that it should work for essentially any food. And we, we think that the mechanism is the same in young kids and adults. So it, it should, it, I think it would work in all ages, but of course, uh, more, more studies have to be done. That's right. Yeah. Okay. So we'll wrap there because there are a lot of additional questions and we were not going to be able to get to all of them, but thank you to you, first of all, for, so Dale, thank you, Dr. Metsu, for your, not just the discussion today and shedding some light on how drugs get developed and what it takes to actually get a drug into, you know, a new indication area like this, but for your personal hand in shepherding this from the beginning, all the way back from those first studies and, and the idea to try to test this in food allergy to having a direct hand with an industry and, and working with some of the leading companies uh, to bring it to life. I mean, it really just is an incredible story and thank you for sharing that. And I would say thank you also to all the, the, uh, the audience today and even more broadly, everyone who um, is out there as a patient or a patient advocate, those that were involved in Zoller studies when it was in investigational in the early days uh, and the courage to step up and get tested. And I would also say that the voice of the patient and everything that FAIR, FAIR donors and this patient community has done to try to help all these stakeholders that Dale mentioned better understand the admit needs and the opportunity, uh, kudos to you. And it really is with kind of the community effort that things like this can happen. Uh, so keep going and keep doing what you're doing as patient advocates and as patients. Um, and, and certainly thank you to FAIR for helping organize this and to help us all keep going. So appreciate it, Dale. Thank you for your time today. Sure, my pleasure. All right, well, with that, we'll end today's discussion. And until next time, uh, thank you for joining and we'll see you again. Thank you.